are back with another episode of The Measurables, powered by Revolt, and shot by my man Cali Vision. Today we are um, pleased to welcome this gentleman to the podcast. Uh, he's been a friend of mine, We've been friends of each other for many years. He's extremely successful in what he does. And his brother, like when he says he's going to do something, he actually makes it happen. His name is Gavin Mathieu, and the brand is Supervision. Welcome to the program, my brother. How are you? I'm well, I'm well, man. Thank you for having me. My brother. So the first thing I want to know, how is your mental? How's your health? How are you? I'm really well, man. Honestly, I'm, I'm, it's a uh, holiday season, you know what I mean, in L.A. So we, I'm, I'm winding down and just taking it easy, relaxing yeah. with the family. You know? Absolutely. So, you know, I think a lot of people in Los Angeles know who you are naturally because you're a son of the city. But for those who don't know who are listening internationally, let us know. I mean, can you just set the stage where you're from, born? Yeah. So I'm from Los Angeles, California, uh, Arlington, Jefferson area. Um, you know, I uh, man, spent my time over there, you know, um, grew up, really spent a lot of time all over L.A., though. But, right. But, um, you know, uh, come from a strong, solid family. You know, my family is is pretty thick in L.A., you know, like. Yeah. <clears throat> generations, my, my mom and pops and my grandfather and his brothers and, you know, all entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of really my upbringing and sort of what kind of bred me, you know, and to be who I am today. So you talk about, you know, the, the, the power of family is, is so important because, you know, there, your, your mother is your first relationship with a woman. Mm -hmm. Your father is your first relationship with a man. Mm -hmm. You talk about them being entrepreneurs. How did that affect who you ultimately became as a young man and are now? So, um, man, you know, interestingly enough, um, I think, you know, what you might imagine to be like the typical roles of a, of a male father figure and a, a woman um you know i think my mom was the one who was a little more tough. stomped down yeah she was yeah. the one who was a little a little tougher you know not so um emotional wow but my father ironically was you know uh showed me what it looked like to be a, a man that was in touch with his emotions yeah and so i think that you know unique combination of the two is what again made me because um you know he he just stood my pop stood so firm in who he was you know he stood so strong and, and set the crazy example not just for me but for my cousins who and and homies of mine who maybe their fathers didn't spend as much time or weren't hmm. around you know yeah um my pops was definitely like a figure for a lot of my friends wow for a lot of uh, my relatives too now, uh, now a lot of people may not know, but your father was a former NFL athlete. Mm -hmm. How 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 much of that do you remember growing up? I was born after he finished playing. Okay, and so all I remember was sort of just him walking around and people recognizing him. You know, right? Older cats being like, "Oh yeah, I used to watch your pops." You know, um, but you know, I think more than anything, what I remember is what he did after football. Right. And so my pops became an attorney after football. <laughs> Fire. Yeah, he was he was just fire, fire bro. Yeah, yeah. And um and you know, he was just when he passed, I mean I knew some I knew the details, but once he passed, I just learned so much more about his life and the things that he did and just how, you know, he was studying on the bus to games, he was studying on the bus to study law, you know. And so uh I have all that in me, you know what I mean? Just, Absolutely. And you could do anything, anything is possible. So there is a, uh, you know, we're talking about athletes, not of this era where they do load management, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about like Art Shell, like that era, Mike Singletary, yeah. where like your brain was getting a professional whooping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The fact that this brother was taking these beatings and administering these beatings mm -hmm. to the opposition and also still studying to become a law professional. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I'm sure you recognize how great that is, but yeah. that like that's incredible to me. Yeah. Because it's just like, bro, like I've seen many, many, many images of the football players who played during that era mm -hmm. and how rough it was. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the fact that you like, you know, you were born after the fact and like you don't even you didn't even know your father as that. You knew him as ESQ, attorney at law. Right. For sure. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's amazing. So you grew up in Los Angeles. You go to high school. At what point do you decide I'm going to get into the fashion industry? Um, it was in high school, um, and I feel like you know I, there was a dude at my school who I, I believe you knew. Pull the mic up. Uh, there was a dude at my school who who um, I believe you knew, and and I don't even like I said I don't know if you even remember this, but. My security guard at my school. You went to school in Pasadena, right? Oh wow! Uh, yes, yes, my yes. My security guard at my school knew you, and that's, wow. that's when we first met. I was probably fourteen years old, and he was—he wow. he was a brother from Pasadena. I forgot his name, and I'm sorry, but he, um, you know, he saw me doing my thing in high school. You know, I had started making some hats, and, yeah, uh, in downtown, and, and so he was like, "Man, I want to introduce you, my boy Boz." This was when you was doing all the like. The sweaters. Hey, the tailored shirts, but you had like the small details of like yeah, 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 yeah. you were well, writing it on the shirt. Yeah, what Virgil ended up doing. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. You was doing that early, early. Yeah, in and like so, two thousand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was I was probably fourteen, fifteen, and that's when we first met. And so it was around that time I started I wanted to get into fashion. I mean, you know, you see people that you look up to, you know, and and the figures and you think about Rockefeller, and you think about Rockaway, and you think about Fat Farm, you think about all these the companies. So but it was in high school when I really started making moves. And so I don't know how many people like know your lineage. Some people meet Jay-Z when he puts out 444, not knowing that he put out Reasonable Doubt. Mm -hmm. I draw that parallel because people may know you as supervision. Mm -hmm. A lot of people may not remember youth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But like what I found so spectacular about your story, and the reason why I love you so much, brother, is that you not only had a brand, but you had your own outpost. Mm -hmm. And like you talk about like your boy introducing you to me mm -hmm. when you was like 14. Like what I found most incredible, and you know, you you never knew this because we never sat down and had this kind of conversation at length, yeah. was that you were a young man with a brand and a store on Fairfax. Mm -hmm. How did like how did youth come about mm -hmm. and how did the store come about? Yeah. Um man it, one night, so at the time, I had a movement in the city called Just Be Cool. Mm -hmm. And Just Be Cool, you know, we were known for, you know, sort of curating the culture. You know, we had early days, Kendrick, Nipsey, you know, Dom Kennedy, all these cats, like, performing at our concerts. Wow. Um, yeah. Oh, like, opening acts, Kendrick Lamar, you know what I mean? Wow. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, I think that um, when I opened my store on Fairfax, my vision for that was... I want to create a place where my community, my network, my culture, like the culture I'm from, can be, can live and, and be exposed to the world through that that platform that was the Fairfax, you know right, what I mean? Right, right. Uh, I felt like that was missing from the block, right? Especially cats that was really from the city or cats that were like of color. Keep yeah, it was, it was like Supreme there, but Supreme is a New York company. Supreme's a New York company. A lot of the cats that own a lot of these streetwear brands was not black. And I'm like, okay, I need a yeah. place for us. Right. So I created youth as a store and gallery that creatives, designers, uh, makers, artists could come and show their work. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. And so, at what point when you're doing youth do you say, you know what, I'm gonna stop doing this, and now I'm a, I'm, I'm gonna transition over to that. Mm -hmm. And that means supervision. Like, why, why, why did youth stop? And why did, you know, just be cool? Like, what what, what happened with that? Yeah. So I think um, it was a time period where I was getting, um, I was overwhelmed. Because mm. yeah. in addition to doing youth, you know, I was consulting and creative directing and designing for, like, other artists and musicians, you know, building mm -hmm. their brand. Yeah. And so that's when, um, you know, I had to make a decision, like, and I, you know, I, I didn't go to school. I didn't go to college or anything for these things. So I really learned business through doing business. Yeah. So at the time, I didn't really understand delegation. Wow. You know, a lot of things I was just carrying on my back and doing it myself. Everything. 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 And so I got overwhelmed and I, it was a moment where I was like, do I want to just like kind of 
stick right here in, in this store and just be that guy or do I want to take this thing global? And, um, you know, through my experience working with the artists and traveling the world and creative directing for them, you know, a lot of a lot of your favorite artists today, um, you know, I, uh, I saw a space for us, the creators behind the scenes mm -hmm. um, and, and building a brand for them or building a, a creative sort of collective of my friends and homies, which became Supervision. Wow. Now, before we delve deep into Supervision, can you just let, you know, just the people know, like, what, who, like who were some of the people that you were helping to cultivate? Yeah, Dom, Dom Kennedy. Um, I worked with Nip, Nipsey Hussle, mm -hmm. um, and then I worked very closely with YG for about five years. Bro. So I was creative director for for 400, built his brand. We were partners, actually, on the brand. Yeah. Um, you know, took it all the way to Barney's. Um, yeah. Did the whole thing, and then— uh, But, but Gavin, this, this is what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to graze over the fact that you yeah. took it to Barney's, because yeah. Barney's, you know, like, there were, there were a handful of us in there, mm -hmm. like Jerry, Virgil— like it wasn't a lot of us there. Yeah. So the fact that you were that that you were there, and that you got the fashion industry to take special note yeah. of like because everybody with influence or what they think is influence got a brand, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to just have the brand on the block and you got like you know you just hustling t-shirts. It's another when you reach brick and mortar, as you well know. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to graze over that. Yeah. How did that happen? Uh man, so. We have been growing the 400 brand now for probably two years or so, really taking it serious. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we were really like, you know, our whole mission on that was like, how do we take our culture, you know, the street culture, you know, L.A. culture. Yeah. And put it in the conversation and just make people respect it. You know, right. Oftentimes people look at what we do as low class hmm. you know, and they look at it as invaluable because it comes from the streets or it comes from people of color. And wow. so, you know, our mission for that entire brand was like, you know, take, you know, gangbanger handwriting and turn it into hieroglyphics. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because that's take, what it is. Take That's what it is. Right. Yeah. Take, you know a pair of, you know, dickies and make them a nice pair of pants, you know, that could be sold at a Barney's or something of that sort. You right. Know, take a flannel shirt that you might think you just get at the swap meet and elevate the materials that is made within the cut and, mm -hmm. and present it in a way that, you know, lets people know, like, we're not, we're not to be played with. Right. So we did that. And, um, you know, shout out to my boy Dan and, uh, and YG as well. You know, we all were really working closely together and we, um, Flew out to, to New York, met with Barney's, showed him the line, <laughs> told him our, our marketing Fire. plan and strategy for the year and Fire. we were planning to do. And uh, and then we happened to throw our first fashion show at the uh, at uh, Microsoft Theater in downtown L.A. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, my, and, and my brother was on stage. And if anybody knows YG, like, you know, like when he gives you props, he like really gives you props. Yeah. Like he was like, yo, this thing right here. I mean, like I remember the whole thing. It, yeah. was, it, was, it, was, it was quite a moment. Yeah. But my ultimate question for you is, were you paid by Barney's? Did they pay their bill? <laughs> yeah, they paid us. Um, yeah, right, right. Good question. We we got paid. I think before, you know we kind of got in there before things really started to get sticky with them. Yeah, um, and, yeah. And they knew, you know, we had influence at the time. You know, mm. the culture, and and I, I don't think they really wanted to play with that. You know, Amen. Yeah. And I know what you mean by the culture. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know. Absolutely. So, you all are reaching unprecedented heights mm -hmm. with 400. Mm -hmm. And you say, you know what? I'm about to, and, and this, goes, this ties back to the question that you answered about what, what made you leave youth to start supervision. Mm -hmm. But when you jump over that pond, it's Nipsey that you helped. It's, mm -hmm. all, it's YG. It's all these people. At a certain point, do you say, all of the all of the work that I'm putting in here, I'd be best suited to do for my own brand. Or were there situations that led situations that you were seeing where you were like, you know what? If if I'm gonna put forth this effort, I might as well put this effort forth on my own project. Yeah, is that how that happened? Yeah, you know, I think um, I always had my own visions and ideas. You know, so right? I uh, you know, 
internally was always just ideating what's next for me. You know, right. I, I constantly look at five, ten years down the line. You know? mm-hmm. And that's just how I create and plan things. Absolutely. And so, you know, I think, um, and, you know, from a business standpoint, too, although I was a partner in 400, you know, you kind of, you, you have disagreements and you don't always see, see eye to eye with people, you know. Correct. So, you know, at the time, I just felt like my spirit was calling me this way. Mm. My spirit was calling me to really, like, put this positivity into, or just this energy into something that could be so pure and clear. Yeah. I didn't want it to be muffled. I didn't want it to be tainted. I wanted it to be clear about how I saw things. Absolutely. And uh, and so, you know, that was just, that was the the inevitable, mm-hmm. was for me to continue to, to like, push my message. Absolutely. Um, in a more uh, clear, direct way. Absolutely. I don't know if you remember this moment. Uh, Charlie mm-hmm. was styling uh, YG for the, the 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 going home celebration performance at the uh, uh, was it it wasn't the BET Awards. Mm. It was uh, I forget what award it was, but it was John Legend, mm. Khaled, and, uh, and they had a choir on stage and YG performed. Mm. And I remember she wanted a red velvet, mm-hmm. but it was a special red that she wanted. It was like the the red cup. And like, you know, I'm from, you know, Altadena, Pasadena. And we got blocks and we got Denver lanes, but like that's the extent of it. Yeah. And I and, and like I have no connection to that world. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if you remember, I called you mm-hmm. and I was like, all right, man, so this is what they want me to make. Yeah. And like I don't want to be pressing the line here. And you was like, Boz, you're a professional. Yeah. You're an artur. Yeah. Like, you don't have to worry about that. And the reason why that was so important to me is because, like, I'm from Altadena, Pasadena. I'm a visitor here in Los Angeles. This is my adopted home. This is where I live. But, like, I don't know the terrain. Like, I didn't know the terrain like that. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you helped me through that and navigate me, because if you would have been like, you know what, Boz, that probably isn't the move for you. I wouldn't have done that job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, like, it was the, it, it was, it was, it, it was the friendship that you show and the guidance mm-hmm. that made that one like one of the most incredible situation. I mean, that performance was legendary. Mm-hmm. It was incredible, and the way he looked yeah. was legendary. So yeah. I, I just want to let you know I appreciate you for that. Oh, hundred percent. Appreciate you for that. 100%. So, moving on with uh, supervision, mm-hmm. there are a lot of um, Apple Macintosh Mac ref- references. Mm-hmm. Like you have thinking different. Mm-hmm. What? What led you to, you know, see that brand and say, you know what, I can reinterpret this a different way? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that that was an homage to Steve Jobs. You know? Yeah. Um, just I study Steve Jobs, you know. Yeah. And um, I was just an homage to, you know, how much he has impacted and um, really created like the fabric of our day-to-day life you know which is Mm -hmm. our our technology right like apple iphone you know right um and then you know when i first started supervision i was shooting everything on my iphone Hmm. i was making a lot of my content like straight off my phone word so a lot of the early day content that's on social and the lookbooks was shot on my iphone and i made that a point of that because i was moving around traveling so much yeah i was like you know i could really like launch a brand off of a phone you know and so you know, I think the thinking different was him telling us to think different and then us, you know, acting it out and playing it out in real life. So thinking different was how I was moving. Absolutely. So do you remember the first piece that you made for youth mm-hmm. and the first piece that you made for supervision? Do you remember those pieces? Yeah, for sure. How were they the same? How were they different? Uh, I mean the super. I think I think it was t-shirts. You know, like that mm-hmm. was my history. That was my yeah. background. You know, it was t-shirts. Like, you know, I, I self-taught. I'm a self-taught graphic designer. You know, mm-hmm. and so for me, t-shirts is like my first love. You know, and so uh, I w- I went into it like let me do what I do. You know? Right. Um, and so I think that's why Supervision has such a strong like T-shirt program and graphic program is just because that's my background. That's what I do. Right. Um, but yeah, man, T-shirts. And and then I made a, a Supervision hat um, that was like a, a big deal at the, at the beginning of the brand. Uh, so yeah, and I wear hats every day. 
Absolutely. So what, what, how did the connection to Adidas happen? Uh, and, 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 and also, <laughs> not to cut your wisdom, are you still there? I don't have no connection to Adidas. Okay. You know, okay. KBG with you. I don't have a connection to Adidas. Okay. You know, um, I uh, I did it. So I have a you know consulting company. You know, um, and I get paid to uh, you know share ideas and, and build worlds. And and you know Adidas wanted to tap into that. Right. Know? And so um, at that time. I was like, hell yeah, like let's do something, you know. Right. Um, right. I don't have a connection to these. That was a long time ago. Yeah. And it's no more. Absolutely. So, in reference to Los Angeles, like when people ask me about my design ethos, it's all about where I was born, where I was raised, how I was raised. Mm -hmm. The community mm -hmm. was, I mean, like, I mean, specifically and scientifically black. Mm -hmm. And although every community has its ills, ours did as well. There was a lot that I gained from it, being in church, mm -hmm. being around the youth, also around the elders. Mm -hmm. All of those things impacted how I carry myself, mm -hmm. what I ended up making. My visual and verbal cadence all comes from people that are rooted there because mm -hmm. it was such a wealthy, um, just such a wealthy bastion of people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize when I was growing up in Altadena, Pasadena, like some of the smartest people in the world are based there. You got JPL, you got, I mean, like, there are so many, like, I mean, just mega money things, mm -hmm. like Rand McNall that makes maps. Mm -hmm. They have, a, like, an estate down the street from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. I give you all these examples to ask you, how did the fabric of Los Angeles inform your design process? Um, man. You know, I think, LA has a very um, humble and like subtle tea about it. Big city, but a small town. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, and also just like how we approach things, you know, it's very cool, chill, laid back. Like the people that's really from LA. Correct. You know, and so we don't really try too hard. Um, I think we kind of just do our thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think, deep down inside we know that our shit is dope and absolutely i think that we don't have to like high sign yeah we don't have to flex and do all the extra you know like we're kind of just like and that's supervision you know like right my you know from the outside in like you know i'm not i'm not reinventing the wheel you know what i mean mm -hmm. but i'm i'm definitely giving you something that you're gonna love and you're gonna have for a long time mm -hmm. i put that care and that attention to detail into it yeah you know and so um that's kind of my favorite thing is just to see when people receive the product in the mail and they like oh man you know and that's how i feel about being from la absolutely absolutely so the the to to just shift the focus from you know youth to all of the other programs that you were involved in enhancing and developing mm -hmm. And just focus the, the spotlight specifically on supervision. Mm -hmm. There are messages that are in your clothing. Mm -hmm. And again, you got to be educated. Mm -hmm. If you're not educated and you and you stumble upon this brand, like you deal with a lot of different situations, mental health, there are a lot of things that you deal with. We got to do better. Mm -hmm. Like, where does that come from? Oh, man. Um I think I I think I've spent time in many different you know pockets of the city. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I have many different influences that I spent time around people, right? Um, from all walks of life, and um, and I think that juxtaposition is what makes supervision right. It's that right. like unique perspective that I have from my experience mm -hmm. that I've been able to um, in a very like what I would say an eloquent way blend together right to where it makes sense and it speaks to the person that um, it speaks to the person that just just pays attention to detail you know you know I think you know I I spend a lot of time with, with gangbangers. You know what I mean. I yeah. spend a lot of time with 
old wealthy white women. You know what I mean? Yeah. I spent a lot of time with my, my pops. I spent a lot of time with my grandfather. Mm-hmm. You know, I spent a lot of time with my cousins. You know, I spent a lot of time with, with my white Jewish friends in, in Beverly Hills. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I picked up a lot, a lot from a lot of people. I'm very observant. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, I just learned things from different people. And, um, again, just like rooted myself in like my, my, my boy AJ would say like your, your, uh, your unique perspective is your competitive advantage. You right. I mean? And so I know that that's my, absolutely. I just got to stay true to me. Yeah. Yeah. So you, me, everybody, we all dealt with COVID. Mm-hmm. COVID was interesting for me because prior to COVID happening, you're just on the hamster wheel, right? Mm-hmm. Got to churn this out, churn and burn, blah, 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 blah. Got to grind, right? Mm-hmm. But COVID forced, I can't speak for anybody else, it forced me to sit down. Mm-hmm. And when you sit down, I have what you, I, I, I have what is called as a come to Jesus moment. Mm-hmm. We've already, we've all had those, mm-hmm. specifically in black America. Mm-hmm. Our parents will tell us, I'm about to have a come to Jesus moment with you. Yeah. And a come to Jesus moment, for those who don't know, is when the spirit is speaking to you. Yeah. And if you're quiet and in tune, the spirit will tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. The key is to not fall the spirit with drugs, being inebriated, blah, blah, blah. Because that, that, that can sometimes shift the focus of the spirit. And you think it's saying something when it's saying something else. Mm-hmm. But COVID forced me to sit down and reevaluate my place in the fashion landscape. Mm-hmm. And so I was fortunate because I was just off of doing this McDonald's thing. They needed masks. There were other people who wanted masks. So I started doing that. But then it was like, okay, we're sitting in front of our computer screens and a lot of people are not client facing. Mm -hmm. But for the people who are client facing, they're not going to be sitting in front of their computers with suits on. Mm -hmm. But they still have to be client facing. Mm -hmm. So that's where Rudiments was born for me. Because I sat and listened, I was like, you know, you got you got you got the brother wearing the Morehouse sweatshirt and the MIT sweats. Mm-hmm. That don't necessarily match, but he's having a conversation with Kellogg's. Mm-hmm. What is he gonna wear? Mm-hmm. So I'm giving you all the I'm giving you all this backdrop to ask you how did COVID influence your business and level set you and focus you in on where you are right now? Um man. COVID, man, it I don't know that it did. I don't know that it influenced my business so much, mm. but definitely me as a person. How so? Delve into that. Um, you know, I I one day um, just started writing. You know, and I wrote mm. I wrote a couple pages, and I titled it. The pandemic saved my life. Wow. And because I think when, like you said, that hamster wheel. It's real, bro. You you can, you can, not, it's not sustainable. You know? Correct. It's not sustainable. And so, um, and I have, you know, I have two kids, you know, I have two kids and I'm, you know, I was in, at the time, like, unhappy relationship. You yeah. Know? And um, just, just going 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 you know mm-hmm. and not paying attention to what's most important you know and so um that first two weeks of the pandemic just being able to like sit down yeah and like really digest everything and process everything um save my life man i honestly would wouldn't be where i am today in this way so so strong and healthy had i continued for the last three years the same way i was moving Right. You know, and so right. um that's really what it did for me. And you know, from a business standpoint, I think it was just man, like I had, you know, the I will say this, like my mission from youth, just be cool, even four hundred, the thing I was trying to get across was the messaging, right? right? I was trying to make statements. I was trying to I was trying to create paradigm shifts. Mm-hmm. You know? And so the pandemic, George Floyd just expedited that, you know, for me, it kind of felt like what they say, uh, success is when preparation meets opportunity. Yes. That was when, you know, I've been, I've been pushing these positive messages since I was 15 years old. 
So right. when everybody's consciousness started to shift, it was, it was like, already there. They was like, "Oh, bro, I've been doing this for fifteen yeah. years," you know. Yeah. And so it was good. It was just perfect timing for me. I think. Wow! 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 All right, man. I got to recalibrate for a second. All right, so post. Well, let me stop for a second. Let me recalibrate this. There were a lot of opportunities that I saw that started to to to, to come about that would come your way. Uh, Golden Voice, mm-hmm. Coachella, mm-hmm. Paxson. Mm-hmm. Are were 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 all of these a direct result of you level setting yourself and your business? Or were those things already things that were already on the horizon mm-hmm. and we just we just hadn't seen them yet? Um so well those two are kind of two different, right? The the Golden Voice thing was definitely connected to you know george floyd and civil unrest and 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 just equality for people of color for black people correct in that movement um but even that you know i think i think what the way the conversation started and the way where where it ended um i think that was you know, due to my grandfather, you know what I mean, mm. telling me, like, you know, make sure you get, they respect you and, and pay you what you're worth, you know. Amen. And so. Word. Um, I think that, uh, you know, everybody was like, how do we do things, especially large companies, wanted to support and wanted to get involved. And um, it was up to us to, like, make sure that when we have those conversations, we set the, make, make create understanding and set mm-hmm. the set the bar like it's this it, sh- it ain't nothing less than this and it's never gonna be nothing less than this right you feel what I'm saying absolutely and so um, that's how that happened and and they've been a great partner you know what I mean like working with Golden Voice has been really good yeah um, but you but, but but you are everywhere though like you got de- I mean I, I went to a Destination Crenshaw celebration and you was there yeah like you are like how do you find yourself at the intersection of all of these things that have to do with community? Well, I think that's to the point, right? Like, I, you know, I told you what the mission was for youth. It was community. Right. The mission for Just Be Cool was community. It was about creating a space for people to think different. Right. About their future. Right. Right. And so uh, that, I think, just was due to everybody looking up and being like, well, dang, bro, has been pushing this message for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, I reached out to um, other brands. I had a lot of conversations with other designers. I'm sure we talked a couple times mm-hmm. throughout that time period and just was, mm-hmm. you know, just reminding one another and holding each other up in a way that was like, look, it's, it's a tough time for us, but also there's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. You know, and all we got to do is stick together and support one another. Mm-hmm. You know? And I think that that was, that was a, a key thing for that time period for a lot of designers and brands to be... Um, you know, just kind of locked in arms and standing on on our business about how much, you know, about getting what we was worth at the time and now. That is the perfect transition to what I want to share with you. Yeah. Casey, mm-hmm. Bricks and Wood, there was a, a post that he had put up, and I believe it was in reference to Golden Voice. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'm paraphrasing. I didn't know my way through this terrain, but my brother came and got me and guided me through that without giving anything proprietary away. What do you think he meant by that? Um, I mean, I, th- I think he meant what he said. I did that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think, I think <laughs> yeah. and that's, that's because I've known Casey for a long time, you know, like, and not even just about that, but, we have to look out for one another, you know, um, you know, and, and, and anything I've been a part of, I didn't want to be a part of it in a, you know, unfair way. You know what I mean? I want to, I, I want, you know, I want to get everything that I'm worth and I want my people to get everything that they're worth. Amen. And so I knew that, you know, the conversations and the lines that I was pressing it was a chance that the other designers involved weren't pressing that same line. Right. And so I called him and I was like, look, 
I'm pushing for this. You need to push for that too. Right. You know, you need to get that much too. And so he was like, all right, you know. And I told him the same thing. Like, any uh, anybody else involved got to get what I'm getting because that's if amazing. We, if we if we if we um, the minute we start to lower our prices, um, the market price lowers. You know, mm-hmm. and so we gotta all kind of be willing to say no. Because you know who's not lowering their standards ever? Mm. It's our Anglo-Saxon. You're right. And our sure. Star David. Yeah. Participants for sure. They coming in. Yeah. This is what we want. And I'm saying it with a strong back yeah. with my chest out. For sure. I ain't happy to be here, bro. You got me here. I know you got it. Mm-hmm. You got three times more than I'm asking for. This is what I want. Yeah. Very nicely. Go get it. Yeah. Like, like and that's okay. That's what it's, that's, that's, man, that's a. It's a given. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's what it's I, a given. You know that. That's why right. you're here. Right. You know I mean, so it's like. Right. And and that and that's you know that's where we are right that's like why when you hit me I'm pulling up mm-hmm. like, you like yo I need you for the podcast I'm like automatic I appreciate that you yes know, sir because it's like this gonna be the next platform you right know? it's one of our new media companies media platforms right you know what I mean absolutely so that's, that's automatic so there have been some like 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 I, I was telling the people I go to a destination Crenshaw spot you there. A Jordan event I'm looking at, you there. Mm -hmm. But you're not just there. You're there with product. Mm -hmm. If you're not there with product, you are there consulting. Mm -hmm. There is some situation you have, like your community has been developed. I mean, in in, in my fair assessment, like it it should be a case study because it's neighborhood. It's about community. It's authentically black. Mm -hmm. It's not a black organization where you are the only black person that's involved. It's black people involved in it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any clients that or do you have a dream client or there is there a brand you want to work with that you haven't worked with mm. not really man honestly I, I recently just got to work with um with karen bass in, in the city of la mm-hmm. and so you know i think that's um how so i did a poster for her c- campaign and um you know i think that uh that was cool because just um the conversations that we had and the things that you know the people on her team and hearing everybody kind of ex- you know explain how important it was for me to be there and to be involved and show up for the city in that way right um just let me know that there's people outside of this industry streetwear industry and all that that's like we need you to continue to create for us and lead for us right. and design or speak for us in certain ways, you know? Um, I think that was really cool. And so it just made me think completely outside of brands, you know? It made me think about just what can I create in the world. Right. And, um, you know, I don't want to say any one brand I would like to work with because um, I don't, you know, I don't have an allegiance to any of them. Right. Because you know I mean? they don't have allegiance to us. Right. So it's, so at the end of the day, it's like who wants to sit down, like we sit down with respect and do business. You know? mm-hmm. um, and so, yeah. You know. So in reference to um, next steps for you, what is like, what is the next five, I mean, again, not giving anything proprietary away, mm-hmm. but like, you know, those who are focusing the now are going to stay in the now. Mm-hmm. You have to be like, you know, you have to visualize it to like know that it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. What do you see as like the next step of supervision? What do you ultimately want the company to be? Um, I ultimately want to create um, that the same energy in the network and the community that I've created in LA in cities across the world, you know, and I think that for me, it's just um, beginning to go spend time in those cities. Yeah. And um, so I've been traveling a lot, you know, just uh, continue to look out for other creatives and, and tap in and just see how we can help people um, and um, just involve people, collaborate with people because I think supervision is a platform. It's not about me. That's why I don't put my face all over the brand or all over the social media. It's mm-hmm. really about the creative community, you know, and so yeah, um, you know, that's where you win, bro. Yeah, 
you were so smart to not name it Gavin. Yeah, right. Like I did, named it War Air. <laughs> so I got to, you know, yeah. you live and you learn. Yeah. How has fatherhood informed your design process, both for your daughter and your son? Like, how is it, how is it the same? How is it different? Yeah. Um, I just, I, when I'm designing or anything I put out into the world, you know, I, I always think of like, is this something they would be proud of, you know, um, word supervision in itself. The idea of supervision is to have a, a big idea and creative vision, but also to supervise and create with a sense of responsibility for what you put out into the world. Absolutely. And so I just make sure that, you know, when, when. 15, 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line, 40, whatever, their grandkids, my grandkids, all that, look back and be like, dang, my, my grandfather was making something dope. Yeah. You know, that really changed things. That resonated. Mm-hmm. So there are three things that I ask, you know, the participants, the guests who come on the show. The first one is the advice you would give to a young professional is know your worth. Second, what would you share with your younger self? Young Matthew, player in the streets, man. What would you share with him? Don't hesitate. Know your worth again. (laughs) So knowing your worth is, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And before I ask the third, because you said know your worth, knowing your worth is relative. It means different things to different people. Some people are focused strictly on the financial. Some people are focused on the matter in which you talk to me when we're working together. Mm-hmm. Other people are just like, you know what? I just want a fair deal, mm-hmm. equitable. When you say know your worth, what does that mean to you? Um, I think know your worth means, um, you know, understand your value and what you bring to the table. And also, there's another side to that coin is, be realistic about it correct um i'm not saying it's arrogant at all in a way like just jump out there and be demanding a million dollars for everything you do yeah um but you should know your worth in in a situation in in a business deal that you know this is what the time that i'm gonna put into it this is what i could go put my time into something else right this is what i can get out of this is it short term is it long term yeah and so you really have to know kind of um the ROI on things and what, um, you know, what you, what you see to get out of a situation and what you're bringing to the situation for the, for the person across the table. Right. Were there, were, were there any professionals that you noticed along the way who were like, you know, a part of the culture that like really informed you and guided you on like, this is what you need to ask for. Yeah. This is where you need to go. This is what you like. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, you know, um, I mean, Nip Nip and I talked about it a lot. You know, this was a lot of the conversations we had was just like, how do we shift things in the culture and in business? Hmm. Um, you know, my, my brother, Jason Maiden, you know, um, also has guided me a lot. Um, and, um, you know, just has, has reminded me that, you know, although my, my upbringing is not your traditional, you know, collegiate path, mm-hmm. um, that I had a lot of wisdom and experience that, and a, and a unique experience that most people can't speak to. Correct. Um, Correct. You know, Jason Maiden was huge. Um, me and my friend Gado, uh, OG, just used to run with the Rockefeller team. Um, early days, gave me a lot of game. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, my grandfather. I mean, again, like my grandfather, my pops, my moms. Again, they just instill values. My grandmother, like in a crazy way, you know. Yeah. Like it's you know like yeah. it's women in our lives that can remind you and tell you like you're loved, you're valuable. You know what I mean? You 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 should walk in anywhere with with some confidence and respect mm-hmm. for people and demand respect for yourself, you know. Knowing your place. Yeah, for sure. Knowing your and and and, and I don't mean knowing your place in a derogatory sense at all. Mm-hmm. Knowing your place meaning if anybody has the right to be here is me, mm-hmm. even more than you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even more than you. Mm-hmm. Cuz I put in triple the work and my our folks is still putting in the work. Mm-hmm. So I deserve it way more than you do. Yeah. Come and on. my eyes aren't blinking or flinching. Come on. Yeah, yeah. I, I deserve this. Yeah, for sure. 
Last one is, of the three, mm -hmm. how do you find peace of mind? Um, I looked at the word um, adv take advantage, right? Hmm. People talk about take advantage. And I think um, when you talk about take advantage of your time, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you got to really like, you gotta you gotta be in control right of your situation and so for me i just create barriers you know i don't go out a lot um i don't make myself so accessible to everybody yeah in what case i and one day I, I might have but i don't anymore as i get older you know why um just because i i value my my free time i value my time with my children you know i know they need me more than anything right and so i don't really spend a lot of time just like bullshitting with people or I mean even my team they know like I'm in and I'm out I'm getting what we need to get done and I'm gone you know right if I want to go like hang out with my team and we laugh we you know play basketball whatever it's cool like for sure but I'm I'm as much as possible racing to get home you know what I mean so I can spend time with them because they honestly you know we don't get as much time with our children as we like to think because they go to school we go to work Right. right. So right. my whole thing right now is my peace of mind is like taking control and owning my time. You know, it's interesting. You say uh, you're talking about your, your, your children. When I initially started my business, my time was my own. Mm -hmm. So I can get up and go anywhere. Yeah. Have friends in Stockholm. Yo, what you doing this weekend? Oh, for New Year's, we going to be out here on a flight. Gone. Yeah, yeah. Japan. Gone. Yeah. China. Gone. Yeah. But when you have children... The thing that is so unique about that whole equation is that your children didn't ask to come. Right. From the R&B jam to you and your lady doing what adults do, that's how you that, that's how you landed here. Yeah. So your time is no longer your own. So I can't speak for you and your children, but I have two sons. Mm -hmm. My oldest son, Mason, in his eyes, I see how he's like, I need you here. He doesn't even have to say it. Mm -hmm. He's just like, I need you here. But not only do I need you here, I need you here actively guiding me. Mm -hmm. Do you get that same feeling, that same sense? For sure. And, and, and it, I, guess, I guess that's a foolish question to ask. I guess the better question I have to ask is, do they ever voice it to you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my daughter, um, who's the eldest of the two, my daughter, I'm a daughter and a son. Mm -hmm. um, when, I first, when we first had her, you know, I was a little bit younger. I was still yeah. moving around in ways. Right. And she used to just kind of remind me, like, Daddy, you work a lot. Mm. A lot. And uh, wow. that was hard on me because I knew why I was working, right, to provide for them and to make right. sure we had the roof over our head. Because, you know, like, you, when you're younger, you're trying to still get it. You're still trying to, you know. And then I think that, um, but I think now, you know, um, now I would just say that, I don't hear that anymore, you know. I don't hear that anymore, you know. Word. And that's a good thing because I know that that I'm I'm filling their cups up as much as they need me to be there. Absolutely. Last question I have for you is, you know, there are so many brands that are part of the fashion calendar. Mm -hmm. Are you all intent on being, you know, I'm going to release this when it's ready, or are you all like, I'm going to be on a calendar, and I want to have a bunch of wholesale accounts, or is it like, you know what, let me, I'm, I'm going to be direct to consumer. Yeah. Cuz I mean I can't speak for you but my business is is completely direct to consumer and it like it cuts out so much foolishness. Mm -hmm. But do you but in in terms of business is that how you all like how do you all see how the end consumer receives your product? Um no, nah, we're 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 doing wholesale now. You know, we are we are focused on direct to consumer as well. And retail soon you know but i think we're doing wholesale now as well because but i think the big piece for us in doing wholesale is have you know do it in a way that's manageable you know we don't right. ever want to get too far from the end consumer you know whether that be right. the, the buyer at the store themselves or the person walking into that store mm -hmm. you know we just want to do it in a way that's like all right we can keep a close relationship with these people and make sure they understand they got our support you know, we, we need to understand that they're committed to our brand and our values. And we do it in a way where, you know, we just like, look, all right, you, it's like selling anything, you know, like, all right, you, you, you a partner, you know what I mean? Right. You a partner in this brand. So right. How are we going to work together to make this, make this go? 
brother, that's my final question. I want to thank you very much, brother, for taking time to just come over and uh, and just, you know, share some thoughts with me about you, your brand, your family, all that. I appreciate you tremendously, brother. Always. Always. I thank, thank you. you, brother. That is another episode of The Measurables, Powered by Revolt. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Peace. It's not the fire.